Hi, everybody. I'm delighted to be here today. In terms of patient advocacy, I didn't know anything about that. I learned as I did it. I learned because if I didn't, I felt like nobody was going to help my husband. There was a point in the story where I really thought, how can I get a medical degree in five minutes? Because I need one. I really need one, because no one else is listening. So I'm going to talk to you today about, for me, it, it, has, it still affects me. Um, emotionally, I have a lot of anger still um, built up about this. But that anger has led me to patient advocacy, because I also know that being angry can be very negative. So my goal is to make something positive out of all of this. And that's why I'm here today, hoping that we can do just that. So as I get started, when I think about communication, What's really important about communication as a teacher or instructor for my college students, this is so true, I have to really be aware in communication of what isn't being said. And I wish I had been more aware of this when we were going through our case. So our story, I've been told many times, was a perfect storm. Um, doctors who worked on our case, I was told repeatedly, this is a perfect storm. This never happens. It never happens. Well, if it never happens, then how come it did? And how, how come it did the way it, it happened? I'm still astounded. So I'm going to let you decide if this was a perfect storm, if there are some other things in our case that maybe if we had communication systems in place that maybe this would not have happened. So our story starts out on a lovely evening in September. 22nd, 2015, uh, my husband and I had just adopted this lovely teddy bear of a dog. He's a uh, boxer, Eli. And uh, my husband and he had just come, were coming back from a, a run through the neighborhood. And as I came back into the court, uh, we lived, just live in a little court, and there was a neighbor walking her dog. And her dog somehow wiggled out of its collar. It was barking and wiggling around, and it came tearing across the court and attacked Eli, our dog, and then attacked my husband as he was trying to get out of the milieu of, of, the, of the little dog battle. So he comes in, and uh, I'm downstairs working, and I hear this, Becky, Becky. So I'm like, oh, gosh, what happened now? So I come upstairs, and there he is, pacing the kitchen, blood streaming down his leg. I'm like, my gosh, what happened? So he tells me this story about the dog bite wound. We clean it up, put some antibiotic ointment on it, and I say, go to the doctor the next day. Well, as a good husband, knowing that he'd have to deal with his wife if he didn't go to the doctor the next day. So he went, he talked to the doctor, the doctor gave him a tetanus shot. And then he offered, the doctor offers antibiotics, and my husband knows that they're overprescribed, especially in Kentucky, but he also thought he doesn't like to take medicine if he doesn't need it. So he talks to the doctor, and the doctor says, you only about 5% of dog bite wounds get infected. And so my husband is an industrial engineer. He does math for a living. So that means 95% of dog bite wounds don't get infected. His dog bite wound looks great. So he's thinking, I'd rather not take these, I'm, uh, but I will come back if it looks like it's getting infected. Doctor thinks that's a great idea. By the way, my husband had a splenectomy when he was 14. It's about 37 years before this. He's lived without a spleen for years, has been very healthy. That never came up in the discussion. That'll be important later on. So Wednesday was fine. Thursday, he leaves for work. We leave early in the morning, and uh, we probably left the house at 6 or 6.30. And he was, I asked him how he's doing. He's doing fine. Dog bite wound looks great. And so I don't think anything of it for the rest of the day. I'm, we're both busy. I get a text from him around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And it says, just heard back from the, from the dog owners. I have the, the medical records for the dogs. So we wanted to make sure we had the vaccine records. And then it said, now I'm not feeling well. Well, I thought he was being facetious, because he's facetious a lot in his text. So I didn't think much about it. So about 5 o'clock when I was leaving work, I just gave him a call just to check in, make sure things were OK. Well, he says, I'm too sick to drive. Can you come pick me up? My husband, not only had he just been running two days ago, he had trained for a half marathon. In April, he had run a half marathon. In June, he had trained for a second half marathon. Didn't run it, but was certainly in shape for it. We bicycled all, all summer. So we were bicycling 40, 50 miles every trip. So he's in pretty good shape. He's been a runner for over 30 years. 
And I'm thinking, you're too sick to drive. He never has been like this. So I'm concerned. So I pick him up from work, and I'm thinking, okay, I'll go to the emergency department. But it's, you know, I live here in Lexington. Traffic's really heavy. All the lights are red. I figure it's going to take me 40 minutes or more to get down to the hospital. I'll just stop by the urgent care center, on because it's right on the way, and they already saw him yesterday. They have all the records. They know the story. So after our usual wait of 25 minutes, the doctor finally sees us. And so David has 102.9 degree fever. He's got blood pressure of 112 over 70. He's, ang he's achy, nauseous, doesn't feel well. Um, he's not really answering the questions the doctor's asking very well. And I'm not sure if he's just not answering or if he doesn't feel well. So I'm concerned. The doctor's very concerned because she now knows that he didn't take any antibiotics. But she never says anything to me about the fact that he's asplenic and that could be a problem. So I'm not aware. So she refers us to the emergency department. She says, we're too small of a center here to do any tests. I'll have to refer you to the emergency department. She gave me two choices of two hostels we have in town out of several, mainly because, now looking back, she knew that they were the two who most likely could handle the case. So I went to the university hospital. I work at the university and trusted them. And uh, so she said, I'm going to call ahead. They will be expecting you. I want you to think about that. What does that mean to you? They will be expecting you. To me, I'm thinking when I get there, they're expecting me. That's what I'm expecting. That means that she's going to relay information to them. I'm in education. If I want to have a student even tested for special needs, I don't just say, hey, I need the student tested. I talk to whoever's going to be doing this. I provide information, documentation. So surely in medicine we do something like that, right? That's what I'm thinking. So we get to the emergency department. I walk in with my husband, and I talk to the attendant when I first get there. She doesn't know we're coming. I say, well, we were just referred by the urgent care do doctor. And she said, well, I don't know anything about that. She said, just sign in. Pretty much the idea was sign in, get in line with everybody else. So I, here I am thinking that I would have been treated a certain way, but no, that wasn't going to happen. So we got in line, and after about 30 minutes, I'm getting antsy. Um, Eli, our dog, the new dog, yeah, he's already gone through one wire crate, had ruined a rug. He is escape, an escape artist. And also we have the two dogs we had, we were trying to get together, and we hadn't yet allowed Eli off a leash with the other dog. I did not feel comfortable having somebody just come in and feed the dogs because I didn't know what was going to happen. So I tell my husband, let me go home. I'll take care of the dogs, and I'll come back. Then I can talk to the doctor when I'm back. Sounds good. My husband seems OK. I figure, hey, the triage nurse surely has the information from the urgent care center. My husband can fill in the holes, and then I can be here to talk to the doctor when I get back. So I get back in probably an hour and 10 minutes, I guess, is about how long it took me to go home and come back. And amazingly enough, when I come in, I walk into the emergency waiting area. I'm walking towards my husband. There's a triage nurse there. She sees me. I still don't know how she knew it was me. And she says, with a hold up a sheet of paper, she says, I've taken a blood sample from your husband, and I sent it to the lab so the doctors will have the results when he's called. I'm like, great. Things are going just as they planned. It's so nice to be someplace where I know they, they know what's going on. They know what they're doing. So... We wait, and we wait, and we wait. And about every 45 minutes to an hour, there was someone else I thought was a triage nurse calling my husband over to a kiosk and asking you know, just to read his vitals. And I'm assuming I'm talking to him, that gentleman, several times. And finally, at quarter of one in the morning, we've been up since five. We're exhausted. My husband's lying over t chairs. He doesn't feel well. And it's like, I asked the registration desk, how much longer do we have, you know? And it looked like it was going to be like 4 a.m. They were calling about one person an hour to go back to the emergency department. So I'm thinking, well, you guys aren't doing anything. Clearly, he's not as sick as I thought, because if he were, wouldn't you be doing something? So I had his vitals measured one more time. Wasn't any change. We went home. I woke up. I think I got home at 1.30, was in bed by 2. Um, David just passed out in the bed when we got home. I woke up at 4 in the morning, worried. I measured his, uh, got a forehead measuring of his temperature, and it was 102.9 again. I thought, well, this is what it was when, we, when 
it was measured in the you know the, earlier this, this evening, so Tylenol probably wore off. So I, brought, I finally got up about an hour and a half later, got the dogs taken care of, got David into the car. Uh, doing all this at once was difficult. Get him back to the emergency department. I bring him in. I was trying to get him out of the car at that point in time. And at that point in time, he's unbalanced. And I'm thinking, well, let me just get you a wheelchair. I grab a wheelchair. I bring him back. He goes to sit down. He can't even figure out where the arm rests are for the wheelchair. Let alone, he can't sit down. He's too unbalanced. So I put him back in the car, go get someone out of the emergency department, and said, can you help me? I need to get my husband in the wheelchair. They send out this lovely young lady who's probably 24 years old, eight months pregnant, and she says, I can't lift anything heavy. And I'm thinking, surely this is who you helped me with. How, you guys were useless last night, and this is who you sent out to me. So I'm a little worried at this point about this emergency department. So anyways, it was fine. She helped me get in the wheelchair. She rolled him in. I went to go park the car. There's no parking near the emergency department. You have to go several blocks away. So about 10 minutes later, I come back in to the emergency department. And the doors whisk open. I walk in. There's a nurse waiting for me. She says, you're needed in the back. Your husband is no longer verbally responsive to the doctors. And I'm thinking, what? Where were you guys last night? So we get back there. I'm telling them, dog bite wound on Tuesday, tetanus shot on Wednesday, got sick. Oh, by the way, we were here last night. And nobody did anything. And so I'm talking to two doctors. Two nurses are looking over him. Awesome team, by the way. They were an awesome team. But the, uh, the doctors are then ask, uh, you know, trying, they're conferring about what they think this is. One of the nurses holds up his hand, fingers and she says, is this what his uh, fingernails look like when you left the house? I'm like, I'm like, do you know what I was trying to do to leave the house? I'm just trying to get him hit in the car, the dog's taken care of. I don't look at his fingernails. They were blue. I knew what that meant. I certainly had never seen it, but I knew what that meant. So I knew we were in trouble. And from that point, I think they gave him a big bulbous um, container of fluids into the arm, gave him some glucose. David woke up right away and looked at me and said, my gosh, where are we? And within less than 30 seconds, he's complaining about not being able to breathe, extreme pain in his abdomen, and then he's drowning in all the fluids they just gave him. He was in DIC, if you know what that is. He was at the point where he was in septic shock he was going into organ failure. And I was eventually moved out of the room. And of course, I'm busy now calling his, hus his uh, boss to say, oh, by the way, my husband's not coming in today. He's critical. I'm calling my, my colleagues who I would, had texted earlier saying, yeah, I can Skype from the emergency department because I was supposed to give them some feedback on stu some students needed some feedback on units. And I said, sorry, can't Skype. Husband's critical. And then I'm trying to get family. We're here alone. All of our families in Pennsylvania. So I'm contacting his family. I'm contacting my family, what's going on. About two hours later, I met. I had some colleagues who came to visit with me. They got me a private waiting room. And then an entourage of doctors and nurses came in. And there was also a, a hospital chaplain was there with me as well. And that's when I met this other doctor. I had never seen her before. She sits down next to me and puts her hand on my lap. And she says, your husband's very, very, very sick. I now know that very, 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 very means that he's dying. She says, you need to be prepared for him not to make it through the day. And that's when I said, I was sitting there thinking, what went wrong? I thought I did everything right. I thought I was trying to get my husband help. I went to the, he goes to the doctor on Wednesday, the day after the dog bite wound. I grew up on a farm. I know a dog bite wound can be dangerous. How come no one gave us the information we needed? How come nobody reacted? Well, after getting over lots of anger, I did some analysis on our case to figure out what really did go wrong. So there's two areas within the chain of events that happened. The first one was that first visit to the urgent care center. So my husband was told that 5% of dog bite wounds get infected. Actually, if you read the research, it's 3 to 18%. But that's considered to be those people who are immune competent. Immune compromised patients have a much higher incident of get, uh, getting the infection. Um, if your asplenic patients are known to be susceptible to overwhelming post infections from dog bite wounds and other animal bite wounds. 
In fact, there's a 50 to 70% mortality rate unless it's identified early on, and then it's only less than 10%. So you would think it'd be kind of important to know whether or not your patient you're treating is asplenic or not. Second of all, that little pathogen that we had, Catenocytophaga canamorsis, maybe you've read this story, it's a horrible story, on um, this gentleman in Wisconsin. It was published at the end of July, and they, but they've had some other follow-up events. The poor man has now had his legs and his arms amputated because of this disease, this infection. It's very fast acting. It comes commonly carried in dogs' mouths. Does everyone get it? No, but it has to get in your bloodstream in some way. But everyone says, very, very, very rare. It never happens. Perfect storm. And yet when I do the research, I did a search on Google, Google Scholar, and I came up with articles on Catenocytophaga canamorsis. Don't tell me it never happens. There's an awful lot of writing that's going on out there. But it would have been nice to know, not even necessarily about this pathogen, but it's really dangerous. In fact, it was Butler who had said, um, she had uh, published a study in 2015, she said that she has found over looking at analyzing cases that have been published since 1994 on C. canamorsis, she concluded that it is the second cause of sepsis in asplenic patients. But it never happens, I was told. She also said it's one of the most lethal causes of sepsis of all the pathogens. But it never happens. So I, I wish the medical personnel had let us know. I don't have to know about C. canamorsis. I just have to know that, gee, if it's a dog bite wound for an asplenic patient, we need to make sure you get antibiotics. Nowadays, if this happens again, it's not just antibiotics. We have to go straight to the emergency room and get an IV antibiotic. Because if it happens again, I could lose my husband. So the second piece that's really, really important to look at is what happened Thursday night. We went to the urgent care center, and then we went to the emergency department. What really happened? Well, very simply, the emergency department didn't have the information I thought they did. And even worse yet, my husband was confused by the time he was finally seen. So they knew nothing about his splenectomy. And by the way, he'd been there to the same emergency department for broken ankles twice before this, and there's still no information in his record about a splenectomy. They didn't know about the dog bite. They didn't know anything about what his temperature was before he got there. They just thought he said that he had a flu shot. I didn't know this, by the way, until after he was um, released from the hospital, and I, re I requested his records. How do you think that made me feel? It made me feel like, it's my fault. I dropped the ball. I shouldn't have left him in the emergency department. I was unaware of all these things going on, and the emergency department was unaware. So in the end, we had a worst case scenario. Leaving my husband there, he couldn't speak for himself, and a triage nurse who certainly wanted to help, but didn't have the information either. We know that sepsis, severe sepsis, is not quite the number one killer, but it is kill. It, we lose so many people every year to sepsis. In our case, our sepsis infection was preventable. It's very disturbing to think that this preventable case went all the way to sepsis. And even when my husband's in the emergency department, I'm saying dog bite wound, and he doesn't have a spleen, nobody made the connection. It was days before I finally had that connection made. I was working behind the scenes to meet with another one of my colleagues, and he did a literature search and found research articles he shared with another physician who was also doing research in the ICU and shared that information with our doctors. Why isn't this information known? I don't know. So we're one of the lucky ones. We're really lucky. I look at the gentleman up in Wisconsin, and my heart goes out to them. My husband lost the top digit, one, di one phalange from three different toes on two feet. He has foot problems today, but you know what? He runs. He runs four to five, miles, uh, four to five times a week, 20 to 28 miles a week. I'm so proud of him. He lost his hearing. He had 5% in one year, 30% in the other year, but none of it was at the, state, the level that you could hear. We were able to get a cochlear implant, and our Christmas present on October 23rd, 2015, was that he, he had that implant turned on and he could hear us, and he could hear me. So we were really lucky. 
So improving health safety to me is really important. It's in this case, improving communication between hospitals, any kind of communication between any healthcare facility, whether it's primary care, whether it's urgent treatment center, whether it's the little clinic at the local um, uh, pharmacy, all of them should be connected some way into the emergency department where they're gonna be referring patients because it's really important for the emergency department to have all the information to make the best diagnosis. So in the end, I'm hoping that our case can really educate others about this, to me, simple issue that could be fixed, a simple communication issue. If we can all work together, I think we could certainly find ways that would mitigate this so that someone else would not have to be in the place that I was placed in, in my husband. See canamorsis, I'm sorry. I'm not one of the ones who now say it never happens. Do a Google search. Just a regular Google search for, for uh, cases that have happened, that have been published in the newspaper. You'll find ours, by the way. I asked um, Washington Post Medical Mysteries column to write our story up, and it was published. That was my first foray into patient advocacy. So it only takes one voice at the right pitch to start an avalanche, says Diana Harley in her book, Return of the Wolf. And I'm hoping that my voice in our story can be that one voice that can start the avalanche of change. Thanks.